Welcome to Founderline, the show where we answer your questions about startups. I'm your host, Joe Beninato. Thanks for joining us today. It is great to have you all with us. Founderline is all about helping people with their startups. You might be someone who's thinking about starting a company and you want to ask a question about what it might be like. Uh, you might have already started a company and you're encountering a situation in, in your company that you want to ask some questions about. Um, you might be an employee who's thinking about joining a startup and you want to um, ask something about what life in a startup is, is really like. In any of those cases, we're here to try and help you. Um, this is a live show, and so that means we're available to take your questions right now. So the best ways to reach us are via email. Our email address is help at founderline.com. And you can also reach us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at founderline. With that, let's get started. Our guest today is Satish Damaraj, who's a partner at Redpoint Ventures. Um, Satish was a founder and early executive at OneBox and Zimbra, and is now an investor in a bunch of great companies, including Sonos, Coin, Nextdoor, and Pure Storage. Satish, welcome and thanks for joining us today. Thank you, thank you for having me. It's great having you here today. I know how busy you are, so really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I thought we could, uh, we could start out just um, with a few questions on your background. Yeah. So um, you started out way back when as an engineer. I don't know how many years ago it was wow. now. But, uh, <laughs> We won't are, you trying to, are you trying to find out what my age really yeah, is? Yeah, yeah. We, we, uh, you we, know, I take off my hair so <laughs> I can hide my age. That's right. Um, and, just, and, you know, we've seen, we've seen a ton of changes in, over the years in uh, technology stacks and what's going on with startups. And maybe you can talk about how that has evolved um, from the time when you were, you know, a young yeah. coding to, to yeah. now when you see these companies. You know, it's interesting going. that you say that because uh, I was primarily involved in the uh, in the shift to the Java platform back in the in the mid '90s, uh, worked for James Gosling and the Java team at uh, at Sun Microsystems. We were 20 people in Palo Alto. Then we moved to Cupertino, and later on we were, you know, we were called JavaSoft. And that's uh, and I actually was the guy who wrote the Java servlets and Java server pages, uh, and the team behind that. Uh, cool. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> if I were to think about the biggest shift, uh, well, first, I mean, language is obviously a lot has changed. I mean, you know, we thought it was a big, big leap to go towards Java, and it was, but, you know, now there's like, you know, you can do it in Go and Python and what have you. Yep. But the bigger shift, I think, is <clears throat> the, the change in open source and the amount of code that you have to write in order to get a system up and running is so so much smaller than it used to be even even five years ago, 10 years ago, for sure. Back when I was coding, you got to write everything. And now the there's thing. a there's a library for everything. And you just have to call the APIs. And just, you know, your code is tighter and smaller. And you're only focused on what you're doing. So that's that's a great thing. Yeah. And, well, and it means companies can get to market so much faster uh, than. That's right. And, and Cheaper and faster. And, you know, yeah. Yeah. I remember the days when we used to have to buy all these Sun servers and oh Oracle databases. Yeah. And the first like three million dollars is going to hardware, you know, hardware and, no and databases, right? So no uh, yeah, that's a uh, that's a different world. Um, so uh, about six years ago, you made the transition over to venture capital, and um, you know they say it takes seven to ten years to figure out if you're any good at it. So maybe you don't know yet. But uh, <laughs> what what have you what have you learned uh, in your time since you switched over to the dark side? What what do you uh, what do you think you've learned in that time? Well, um, you know, uh, I think uh, you learn a lot about yourself. Uh, venture capital is a lot about conviction, about uh, whether you can follow your gut more than anything else, especially in the early stages where there's not a lot of data that you can rely on. So it's not like, you know, you can look at a company's revenue tra trajectory or, you know. So that's why it's mostly a people business and it remains a people business in the early stages. And so one of the things, um, back when, it, and now it's a different time, but back when I joined Venture, which was in early 2009, there were still not too many operators and entrepreneurs who were going into venture capital. Right. and. Uh, there was famously a pool whether or not I would last in venture capital for more than a year. Uh, when Inside I, of Redpoint or uh, in no, general? No. 
uh, in uh, the Zimbra employees and <laughs> other investors and awesome. VCs who knew me. Wow. They were so, like, there's so what no. was the over under on the uh, I think I think it was way everyone thought that I wouldn't last for more than a year in venture. Wow. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, curiously if you have ADD which I do, uh, then Actually, venture is a good thing because you're doing too many different things. You know, every day you're looking at three new deals, helping two different companies do at different stages, do different things, and then you know your, your day goes by. And um, I think you know, for me, uh, I learned that that was something that you know personally that that that, that was fun. And then the second thing I learned was, you know, uh, there was no way. I could personally keep up with everything that's going on in tech unless I, I hang out with the younger generation of entrepreneurs who, who you know, who are actually living and breathing and inventing it, and um, for for an old guy like me, oh, you know, <laughs> no, I'm saying compared to like what's going on, the tech business is just so fast and everything is you know changing so fast. And yeah. For us, for me to keep a good tap on it. Uh, I think this this I I really like where I sit in the ecosystem because I I see all the innovation as it happens and honestly there's nothing that keeps you younger than that in the tech business you know it's like it's like in your personal life you want to have children right to grow yep. you know to keep uh, you young yeah to keep you young so yeah it's the same same sort of thing do you do you miss the um, th there's, there's, role? well there's nothing like being inside of a startup that you know is doing well and of course you have ups and downs and there are really horrible days um, but but there's a rush that comes with you know this, this is gonna make it you know and you, you don't get that same you know Absolutely. you're like one step removed from that with in the VC roles so there, there are two differences right um, the first one is that is one of control where when you're running a company the buck stops with you right and, yep. and you have complete control over all the decisions, um, and if the company succeeds or fails, it's on you, and you, you know, create the product strategy and the market strategy and and all of that stuff. And as a VC, it's the opposite, which is you have no control, right? People think that VCs have control or a board has control, and sometimes they do, but for the most part, good boards and good VCs, I mean, you don't have control. You know, you have influence, and you probably trying to influence the entrepreneur. Sometimes maybe wrongly so, you know, towards what you think is the right thing. Right. Um, but you have no control. And the rush comes from the control of just, you know, and the responsibility that comes from that. And then the second thing is the economics. And go back to one thing that you said. Um, the economics, what I, was what I was thinking about, if you're part of a really, really successful startup, then, you know, the founder, CEO, it's making sh a lot of money. VCs, obviously, a lot of money in, in, the, in the VC land as well. But it's generally termed as a get rich slowly right. kind of business. That's why you talked about the seven to 10 years earlier. And that's right. all true because right. you, know, you want to be investing in companies, and those companies have to mature. And, and but you got to have diversified portfolio. diversified portfolio. So it's more guaranteed than, well, if you're doing your business well, it's more guaranteed money yep. if you have a diversified portfolio versus like putting all your eggs in one basket and going for it. But if it <laughs> hits, you know, your it payday hits, is it hits huge, big. right? The one thing um, that you said earlier that I want to go back to is if you're part of a winning company, then yeah, the rush is superb. But the probability that that'll happen, you know, it's a lot of, I mean, no matter how or what anyone says to you, I think there's a lot of luck involved. Absolutely. In running a successful company. Yep. And, you know, I've been fortunate to be part of a couple, but unless you have a winning company, the, ru the rush is not a good rush. Yeah. You know? It's a downward rush it's frequently. It's a downward rush. So. Uh, I, I, I hear you. Um, it, it is... Um, it is interesting, though. I, I, in recent years, have become more convinced that the role that luck and market plays as opposed to team and product necessarily. I think you have to have team and product. But if you start out in a small market, um, 
uh, odds of it being a big success are relatively low. So uh, team and product are necessary but not sufficient condition. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Totally agree. Um, so you know, in looking at the sorts of companies you work with. Um, they can't really pigeonhole you as the something guy, right? You, you've yeah. done consumer hardware with Sonos. Yeah. You're doing pure storage. Yeah. Uh, you've got Nextdoor, so consumer yeah. internet, right? Yeah. So you're you're kind of all over the map. Is yeah. this the, the part of this ADD syndrome? Yeah, it's or, part uh, of the ADD syndrome. Um, really, I mean, one of the things that I mean, in the VC business, one of the things that I um, I'm lucky to come in with is uh, well, one box was a consumer company, and Zimbra was straddled between enterprise and consumer. And then I had, because of my Java background, a lot of enterprise software knowledge, and and so um, I'm intellectually curious about you know hard computer science problems like a pure storage, um, but all and and a map R, but also you know um, uh, socially the people that I hang out with and I the way I think and my own personality is, it, you know, veers me towards, you know, the Sonoses and the next doors of the world. And so um, whenever I see good people coming up with interesting ideas, then, you know, then I get interested. So I don't, you know, and that's pretty atypical for a VC. I think most VCs pick an area and then pick projects in that area and create a map of that area and know all the companies in the area. And maybe it's to my disadvantage that I don't have that, but you know, on the other hand, I like the fact that I have, you know, one day I can worry about consumer, another day I can worry about enterprise. Yeah, it's good uh, diversity. Huh? Yeah. That's awesome. Um, well, why don't we uh, see if we can help some people out? So we're going to take some questions from, uh, from the crowd. Um, remember, if you want to reach us, you can email us to uh, help at founderline.com, or you can tweet to at founderline. So uh, let's start off with a question from... Michael in San Jose, it's actually about Zimbra. So Zimbra was quite ahead of its time integrating both cloud and mobile when mobile was still young and the cloud didn't really exist yet. What was the process for coming up with the product? How did you describe Zimba, Zimbra when pitching it to VCs? What advice do you have for a new startup trying to describe their product which is still being defined? So somebody did their yeah. homework on you. No, I know that's, that's a pretty good question. Uh, so, um, and t talk about what Zimbra was for yeah. those who don't know. Just so uh, Zimbra was uh, a reimagination of uh, work email on the web browser. So um, this was bef Zimbra was conceived and pitched to VCs and raised its capital before Gmail came online. Okay. But it was the principles of Ajax, which basically is a way to make a web browser so rich that you don't miss your desktop application. So you don't miss your Outlook. Your webmail is so much better than your Outlook. Got it. Which it was the case back when we were thinking about, you know, uh, I was working at OpenWave, and we had Exchange and, and Outlook. And then we were on Yahoo Mail back then, and the webmail was so much better and, and easier to use than Outlook. And, you know, I was thinking of bridging, you know, taking consumer tech and bringing it to the enterprise, and that was the genesis of that. And then, what year was this approximately? Uh, this was 2003. 2003, so pretty early. Pretty early. Ajax was Ajax not was not a term yet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and my co-founder Ross, uh, he, um, I had two co-founders, Ross and Roland. They were both, you know, uh, pretty savvy engineers, and they basically came out and said, "Hey, you know what? We can make JavaScript in the browser much." more powerful and richer. Hmm. And so I started thinking about along those lines and what could we do and we said, hey, email is something that, you know, everyone uses every day at the at the corporate at the corporate level and people are having fun with email on the consumer side of things, but why is it why is it gotta be so broken? Because back then the other problems of having a web browser versus a desktop is you gotta dial into a VPN first and then fire up your Outlook before you can, but, but if you have a web browser, then HTTP flows through the tunnel, and then, you know, it, so there's a lot of different reasons why that worked. But back to his question, <coughs> uh, how do we come up with it? So, uh, with two independent thoughts. One was that, you know, in general, Outlook and Exchange were kind of broken, and that, you know, it was time to reimagine things for a newer platform. 
we thought that was the web platform uh, and the mobile platform. Uh, this was obviously before iPhone, but we were we were thinking about mobile IMAP and push push IMAP and BlackBerry uh, yep. enterprise <laughs> integration. Wow! Uh, so we're thinking about that, and then worrying about you know how to make the web experience so rich, you know, drag and drop, and all the. I, I still remember we launched at Web 2.0, and um, we did the launch the next day. You know, we were re-invited to demo at the keynote. Uh, so Tim O'Reilly liked the demo so much, and he brought us back because it was the first time where someone looked at a web browser and said, "Shit, you know, you can do things like this." You know, there was a, you know, the demo that we had where you could drag and drop things, and there was an address, and you can mouse over on the address, and a map will pop up, and it was really, really a rich interaction. More than rich, it was really fast, and was all on the web browser, and that solved a lot of security problems for the enterprise. And yeah. So, so it was a combination of. You know the availability of JavaScript and the richness that that it provided at that point in time, and the shift in mentality for away from desktops to the web, and the erosion of the control of Microsoft, all kind of confluenced at the same time. Yeah, that's cool. So how did we pitch it? Um, that was the other question yeah. he asked. Yeah. Uh, one of the things uh, we went and pitched was we said, look, email is a multi multi billion dollar market, right? And there's a massive platform shift towards the web. And we're going to, even if we take some slice of that market, you know, it's gonna be it's gonna be significant. And you know, I think it helped a lot that there was, you know, IMAX coming in back then, you know, um, and so there was a lot of shift going on to the web and we said, look at the web technologies that are coming in with the new version of JavaScript. And so we put it all together. Um, and convince the VCs that the market is big and there's a disruption in the in the platform. And so you raised the first round in 2003, 2004? 2000, 2003, yeah. And and like what what amount did you raise at that point? Like this the, the people don't four understand. Million. Yeah, that that was like the first money in, right? First it's money not in was one 4 of million. 500k things. So. And it was split between Benchmark and Redpoint. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not bad. Yeah. Uh, not bad. That's yeah. great. And then how much did you raise over the life of the company? Uh, 20, I have to say 25 or something like that. So yeah. two, two to three rounds, something three like rounds. that? Three rounds, we did yeah. three rounds, yeah. yeah. So like today, what do, you, what do you think it would cost to do that same company, you know, it's probably. It's, it's interesting, right? To do the same tech in the company, you'll need, you know, far less capital, Yeah. right? Yeah. But you probably go raise a hundred million dollars and just, you know? <laughs> And, and you would go it. big. You yeah. go spend it. You would go, you know, that's that's how the, yeah, that's how it crazy. is. Crazy. All right. Well, hopefully, uh, Michael. Hopefully that helps a little bit. Um, let's move on. Uh, we got a question here from Brian in Chicago. How does a seed stage company get noticed by an investor like you? Is it a referral from one of our existing investors? The demo day, a press article. Could you give some examples of how you discovered? some of the companies you invested in? Great question. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. I think uh, uh, all three ways that he mentioned, you know, demo days, press article, as well as uh, referrals work, but the strongest source, the strongest signal is a referral from one of your angel networks. And the reason, uh, and sometimes it's unfortunate that that's the case, but the reason that that's the case is that um, at the end, you know, at every investment is a people and a relationship, and 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 um, I just tweeted out this yesterday when um, Chancellor Merkel said, you know, the most important currency in the Greece crisis is lost, and that's the currency of trust. And that's so true in our field as well, and in our in in venture capital where. Everything is based on trust, right? I mean, the term sheet might say one thing or the other. No, we, the lawyers, you know, argue with the term sheet about this and that. But at the end of the day, when a board meets together and there's trust between the CEO and the board, you know, things work. And so, I think to establish that trust, coming a referral coming in from a source that is our friend, you know, establishes some of that trust, you know, early on before the deal is made. And so that's that's important. Uh, obviously, you know, we go to you know, demo days. The problem with demo days is like you see 10 demos and these are all exceptional entrepreneurs and they're all 
equally compelling and you you don't you know it's right. so much harder to stand out yes uh, unless some investor comes in with hey i'm looking for this particular market and idea and and he happens to see one right, right. Um, the hardest is of course reading a press article i mean you know i never read a press article and say hey you know let me go follow up on this right uh usually that's already come by our desk or you know it, it's going to be really hard yeah uh, to do it that way so so maybe give some examples from so like like Sonos, were you were you a well, customer so, so yeah. first? No, uh, Sonos. That might be a different. No, no, Sonos. So I, it, it's, many of my examples are going to be um, different because it's all relationship. Sonos. I know John McFarlane, the founder and CEO of Sonos, as a personal friend for twenty years. Okay. So that was a different. That was a different deal. You guys Pure worked storage, together or something? We worked or? together. Pure Storage. Scott Dietzen and I did Zimbra together. Okay. And he's the he's the CEO of Pure Storage. So there's a lot of personal relationships that come into this. Uh, what about if I talk about other things? Yeah. Uh, le, you know, le, let's talk about uh, Coin, which you know, it's it's a good example. Um, and uh, that referral came from Manu, who's in K9 Ventures, and he um, he said, "Hey, you know, we were just catching up at lunch one time, and he was talking about, you know, I said, hey, give me all the crazy ideas, give me far out crazy ideas that you guys are investing in.' And he talked about five or six of them, and he talked about Coin, and said, "Hey." Back up. That's that's interesting. You know, I want to follow up, and so he introduced me. We built a relationship with Kanishk, uh, and uh, committed early on. You know, uh, to like invest part of the seed round. Part or? of the seed round. Oh, okay. We committed uh, half a million bucks just to you know because we really believed that you know, and and Coin was like a big you know mess of a circuit with. A card hanging at the end of it, you know, and he was going to compress it all into this, into this card that I have that Very I carry. Card, you know. yeah. And we said, okay, let's. I think if he can do that, that'll be interesting. And so, we did that. So, so how did that happen? So, referral came in from a really trusted source. Manu is really trusted. We're friends, and yep. we know that he's not really, you know. And then we established trust and relationship with the founder, and then that's how. You know the deed happens. Got it. All right, good advice. Um, I hope uh, Brian. I hope that that helps out a little bit. Um, let's do another one here. This one is from uh, Pascal in San Ramon. What are the main advantages and disadvantages of an uncapped note versus a priced round? Which do you prefer? So th this comes up all the time, and uh, I, I actually go back and forth on it a little bit. I know some people have religion about we only do notes or we only do price rounds or we don't do one or the other so do you do you have a you know a rule that you follow or we don't have a rule okay the reason we don't have a rule is all rules are we've tried to, when you see a deal you know that establishes a new rule you yeah. know yeah uh, but in general do we have thoughts on this absolutely um, I think you know an uncapped note is really, really unfair to the seed investors, right? Absolutely. Um, and the reason why it is, is you're taking some money from the seed investor, and I mean, you gotta think about the risk reward curve. Why is, why is Series A more expensive than seed? Why is Series B more expensive than Series A? And why are the growth guys investing at a billion dollars? Well, we're investing at you know 10 pre or 15 pre. The reason is the risk is being taken away at every stage, and the more de-risked it becomes the higher the price. So yes. now let's talk about seed. That's I mean that's venture capital. So now let's talk about what you're doing with an uncapped note. With an uncapped note, you're taking all the risk at the seed level, but then if the deal works and it's a great product, then you pay the same price that you know a Series A investor pays. Um, minus some discount, but minus not, some discount, not but much. that's uh, you know fifteen percent or whatever. That's right. not, you know, what you really want is that if you're, and we don't play in the seed stage as much. I'm just you know, and honestly, as a Series A investor, we don't actually care. In fact, as a VC, as a Series A investor, we kind of like uncapped notes because a lot of the cap table is not already taken. I see. You know, and so there's no ownership struggle. You know. And then there's the opposite problem where, you know, 
we come into a Series A and you know the seed, 50% of the company is already owned, right? And then that's that's bad too, you know. So you want to find that right balance where the seed guys are rewarded for the risk that they took, and then there's enough for the Series A investors to play, and there's still enough for the founders uh, in that pie. So so let's take an example at a similar valuation. Let's say like six, you know, cap note at six versus a price round at, I don't know if it'd be five pre or six pre or, you know, something along, along those lines, raising one to two million dollars. Do you have any advice for uh, Pascal? Like which would well, be I better think, or worse? Um, I think for the entrepreneur, I think the note is always better because then there is not enough, then there is no uh, legal costs and all of that stuff. Yep. But for, uh, for the seed investor, again, I think a price round is better because you know you're getting shares at this price and this, you have this many shares. This a lot of things happens, yeah. you know, when Series A happens because depending on the price and the post money, was the cap at the pre-money, you know, what did you do with the option pool? How long? How long? And yeah. all of this stuff happens. Yeah. And so at the end, you don't have a clear view on what your real ownership is as a seed investor. Yep. And so I can understand seed guys saying, hey, I want to buy shares um, for that risk. But I think it's not that far off. An uncapped note is, you know, on the, in my opinion, on the say, you know, the, uh, the uncapped note is extremely entrepreneur friendly and, right. and, and you know, the price round is seed friendly and I think a cap note is somewhere in the middle. Got you it. Know? Yeah, I don't know. Did you see the thing Brad Feld uh, wrote no, I yesterday <laughs> or hear no, about I haven't. it? Yeah, I heard I heard about it, but I haven't read so, it. So you know, basically um, <laughs> recapped, uh, you know, note, and, and, and that wiped out all of the um, existing seed investors except for the guy who, or I think it was a guy who was yeah. part of the original round, and he, yeah. you know he's. He's, he's stepping up and he's putting more money in, but basically wiping out everybody yeah, else. Yeah, because you can wait for the term of the note and repay the note with interest, and boom, you're done all of a sudden. You well, know? They, they just they just cleared them out. I mean, it was, yeah. it, it was zero, basically. I think yeah, they priced it at $100 per year or something. So that, that was uh, bad, and you know, Brad said, hey, we're not working with those people ever again, right? So um, you pick your, your battles, but... Uh, you know, I, I go back and forth on it. I've done both, and um, actually, there's there's some hidden stuff in the notes that end up it ends up biting you a little bit depending on the time frame that it takes to go get it. So um, I don't know. I, part of me says, you know, just do the just do the price round, and everybody knows what they have. But uh, I, I see the advantages of both, so you never know. Um, all right, let's do one more before the uh, the thank yous to our sponsors. Um, we have one here from Alice in New York City. Um, what is your take on the Reddit situation? Uh, does Redpoint do anything proactively to support female entrepreneurs? And this was a longer question with some thoughts about, uh, I mean, there are so many things going on at Reddit. And if you don't want to talk about it, that's fine. But, uh, you, you guys are not investors, right? Oh, no, we're um, not. So, so what, what's, what's your take as a, you know, not necessarily the Redpoint point of view, but just uh, from what you've been yeah, seeing? Yeah, the Reddit there. situation is, you know, um, I think the Reddit situation is completely different than, you know, the second question, just because Alan used to be the CEO of Reddit. You know, I don't want to tie those two together. Okay. okay. Uh, I mean, the Reddit situation, I mean, you, can, you know, Reddit is a community site, and, you know, you got to always, you know, once you have that, you know, you got you to gotta always respect, you know, whom, whom the community wants to work with and who they love, and you can't impose corporate, you know, you can't edicts you know, e edicts and yeah. that's you know clearly when that happened it backfired and so that's the reddit situation yeah um on uh, the second question uh, i mean it's cliche and needless to say but obviously we need more you know women's perspectives in 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 uh, in venture and in in uh, in entrepreneurship I'm proud to say that um, I personally back two female founders. One is Sarah Leary at Nextdoor. She's awesome. And then Madura at Platform 9, which is an enterprise company that we backed in Series A um, that I led. So, you know. Uh, and that, I have to assume that was coincidence, right? Like it was coincidence, You weren't yeah. actively like, no, you know. No, we aren't actively looking for 
gender, race, or anything. Right? We're just, looking for want... great ideas, yeah, great people. Exactly. And uh, I mean, that's the beauty of the valley. And you know, um, yeah. I, th that's the part that I think the press sometimes gets wrong. Is um, you know, this valley really is a meritocracy and the best people independent of any, you know, where they're from, who they are, who they love, yes. uh, anything else. Absolutely. If, if you're good at what you do, like, yes. <laughs> there's going to be a job for you or a financing or whatever. Yes. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think sometimes that, get, that gets lost. Like, people are actively, you know, excluding certain people of, of this category or that. And I... I I mean, I've come across it a few times where there's some biases, but... Uh, I mean, you look, I mean, every industry has its biases, and the Valley has its biases, the venture and entrepreneurial community, everyone has their biases. But um, the question is, by and large, I mean, the people that, you know, uh, if you look at the community at large, I mean, is there, is there, is there a rampant, you know, that the explicit thing that you see? I, you know, I hope not. Um, you know, uh, obviously, you know, people might have stories of their own, but, you know, I hope that that's not the case and the yeah. Valley is more uh, meritocracy, which is what I believe it is. So. Great. All right, well, let's, um, let's take a moment, just relax for a minute, and uh, we're going to do some thank yous for our sponsors. Um, we would not be able to do this show without the support we receive from our amazing sponsors. Uh, we have four for this season. They are Auric, Square One Bank, Accretive Solutions, and Ustream. And let me start off with Auric. Um, Mitch Zukli, who's the chairman over there, uh, has been someone I've worked with many, many years over multiple companies, and uh, just a great guy who um, really pours his heart into what he does. And I always tell um, the companies that, and the founders that I'm working with that you want to get a great lawyer early in your company's uh, formation, not just so that they can do the paperwork and the financing documents, whether it's a note or you know a priced round or whatever, or the employment agreements or partnerships or whatever. Uh, of course, they're going to do that. But beyond that, you want somebody who's going to be a great advisor, somebody who's seen so many different situations, um, many, many hirings and firings and financings and everything else that goes on. And they're going to be able to tell you, hey, you know, Joe, this is not typical. You probably shouldn't ask for this kind of crazy thing in, in this document. Or this is more standard. We've seen five of these in the last month. And so that seems to be the way this is going. Uh, you know, that question of cap notes versus um, price financings earlier, same sort of thing. So you want to get a great advisor who can help you out. Um, Auric uh, does a really great job with the entrepreneurs I know who have worked with them. And um, you can go uh, check them out on their website and find out more. It is auric.com. Um, next, I want to thank uh, our sponsor, Square One Bank. And I've been uh, working with the team over there as well for, for many years, uh, Sam Bomick and Lori lumenti Gardi. And you know when you have uh, a financial partner of course, they're going to do the basics, like take care of the money and make sure it's safe. Uh, when Satish writes you a big check for $10 million, you want to make sure it goes someplace, uh, it doesn't go to Vegas with you. So that part, you know, that's, that's par for the course. What, what you want beyond that is help with some of the basic stuff. So um, things like online banking that really works, uh, you know, help with company credit cards for, for the management team or for the executives, whoever, whoever needs them and is charging a lot, so they're not accumulating personal debt on their credit cards just in case something goes wrong. Uh, you know, you want to you make sure you have access to those sorts of uh, services. So the team over there is great. They can work with you to set up all these things. Um, you can find out more at their website. It is squareonebank.com. It's square and the number one bank.com. Uh, also this season, we have Accretive Solutions, and they are the leading business outsourcing firm in Silicon Valley. And Martini Niganel uh, is the person I've worked with there as my interim CFO. And uh, if you don't know what business outsourcing is, it's basically take your finance function, payroll, um, you know, making sure that the bills are getting paid, uh, you know, accounts receivable, accounts payable. Uh, anything related to finance, your board packages, which you want to um, distribute to your investors on somewhat regular basis, 
um, all that sort of stuff. You as a CEO have limited cycles, and of course you could go do the payroll yourself if you wanted to, but trust me, that is not something you want to be doing. You want to outsource this they, very cost effectively. They can take care of this stuff for you. Um, they can make sure that all the numbers are adding up correctly, and you can go focus on your product and your business and the, and the major things that you need to be doing with your time, which is always uh, in short supply. So um, go check them out. Uh, they're, they're great to work with. Their website is as-bos.com. And then finally, um, I want to thank the team over at Ustream. Uh, Brad Hunstable, who's the CEO there, has been a supporter of the show from the very beginning. And uh, we wouldn't be able to bring this to you without the support we get from those guys. Uh, if you're thinking about doing any uh, live streaming, whether it be for a corporate event or maybe you want to do a show of some sort, um, you can uh, find out more from them as well. Their, their streaming stuff is the best, and uh, they do a great job on the customer service side as well. Um, you can find out more at their website, which is ustream.tv. And that's it for commercials. So um, let's dive back into the questions. Uh, once again, if you want to reach us, you can uh, try us on email, help at founderline.com. And you can also uh, reach us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at founderline. So we've got one here from uh, TJ in San Francisco. What are the characteristics of the most successful founders you've worked with? Any patterns? What do you think? For sure there are patterns. Um, um, they're all crazy. They're all crazy. <laughs> Uh, they're all thinking that they could do things that you would say, well, that's not possible, and they're still trying to do it. Uh, like Kanish said, I have this yeah, big yeah. mess. Yeah, I'm going to make it into a small car. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, or they're taking on big, huge giants, and they're going, going up against it, and they're like, hey, I'm going to go after IBM or Microsoft or Apple or whatever, and they're going, <laughs> you know, and they really believe it. I mean, um, so there's that. Um, uh, they're really, really driven people. Uh, you can tell they're competitive. Uh, they're driven. Uh, that's usually a quality you see. You know. Uh, How does that come across, like in the pitch meetings? Like, do you can you just smell it somehow? Oh, or, uh, oh yeah, yeah. You, you, yeah. We, we, you can absolutely smell it. I mean, um, ev. You know, everything from the way they deal with you, the way they're positioning everything, you know. Uh, and uh, typically, they're, they're also able to attract other great people to come and work alongside them. Uh, successful founders any, in any uh, event are definitely able to do that. Yep. And so that is, you know, roughly like leadership or... Uh, the founder charm or whatever it is that they are able to bring people, you know, hire hire all these people to come and work for them and follow them with their crazy idea. And you're like, okay, you had a crazy idea, but then you got all these smart people to come and join you, you know, executing on this crazy idea yep. that has a nine in ten chance of failure. Yep. You know, so, yeah. Um, Sounds good. All right, TJ, hope that, hope that helps. Um, let's go to, uh, this one's from Mikey in New York City. Given that the best investments are often non-consensus in nature, how do you keep an open mind when deciding on an investment before rushing into your initial instincts? Well, that's, that's a great question. It's a really tough one. And the only way you get that is through experience in the business, right? When you... You know, you've seen all of the tweets and things about people turning down big things. When you turn down a Twitter or a Facebook and you live with that, then you know the next time you see a company and there's like 99 reasons for every deal, and especially great ones like he, like he rightly says, there are 99 reasons why it won't work and one reason that it will. And you want to you want to not be unaware of the 99 reasons. You want to be aware of the 99 reasons. You want to internalize them. You want to say, yeah, I'm okay with those 99 reasons why this will fail. 
and we're not in the bank business. We're in the venture capital business. We're taking risk. And if nine out of, you know, one of the things that if all your deals are doing well, then guess what? You're not taking enough risk. Then, you know, um, if you construct a fund where all your deals succeed, then I bet you your fund will be like a 1x or a 2x fund. You know, if you want that 3x, 5x, 10x, Yep. you know, fund, then a lot of your deals have to fail because then you're taking enough risks as that other deals bring you that 10x. And so, uh, so once you've seen the movie before, then you have that. And then what we do, I mean, at Redpoint, you know, we allow people's conviction, gut, and passion to take precedence over a majority or a consensus vote. Wow. And so a lot of... A lot of good venture capital firms follow that. Um, so, so to be specific, like let's say there was something crazy that you really wanted to do, but you know a majority of the other partners thought that was not a good would, idea. It would happen. You can still write that check. You can still write the check, but you know, <laughs> no, no, no. It's just basically your your partners are there to help you think through the tough questions. Uh, ask you the probing questions, ask you questions that will keep you sleepless at night. And despite that, if your gut is still saying, God, I, you know, there's something here, then you want to encourage that. Because that's what venture capital is all about. Uh, I, I've heard people say that the best deals are the ones where there's the most contention around it. No doubt. No like, doubt. Like, oh, that's crazy. No way. That's true. And I think that's true in every firm. Yeah. yeah. All right, great. Well, I. I, I always, it's, I'm just fascinated by firm dynamics, right? And yeah. every partnership is slightly different. Um, right. Uh, you know, I know some are more highly political, others yeah. less so. And, you know, you have to decide, hey, do I want to lay down across the tracks because yeah. next time that guy's going to get even with me or, you know, whatever. So um, hopefully that's not the case with you guys. I that's don't absolutely not is. the case. And that's the reason why. I guess I survived in the business for this long is because of the culture that we have. Yeah, you know? yeah. that's great. All right, awesome. Um, thank you for the question, Mikey. Let's uh, move on here. This one is from Tommy in Palo Alto. How did you handle disagreements between founding teams when you were working in startups and now that you are an investor? Please give specific examples, thanks. Yep. So, so there's always disagreements between founders. Uh, <coughs> So maybe walk through some examples of back when you were uh, back when you were, when you were a founder. Yeah. Um, so you know, our founding team. I don't know whether this example. Maybe it works in. Okay. We were friends for a long time. Which one are you talking about, Zimbra? Uh, Zimbra, yeah. Okay. Um, and um, um, there were lots of disagreements. I mean, when we signed, we signed a customer that. Uh, eventually ended up being a $20 million customer to us, uh, but had so many requirements that the entire founding team, excepting for me, were literally livid that we would even be talking to the customer and that we shouldn't even be doing this. Just um, because it was going to take too much time to do all this custom stuff or And it's whatever. distraction, right? It's huge distraction, which I it see. was. I see. Um, at the end of the day, you know, uh, the CEO of the company should be able to make decisions uh, that are hugely unpopular with the founders. And the founders, at the end of the day, can spend like two days vetting it and saying how stupid it is and how crazy it is. But once the decision is made, that the culture is such that everyone embraces the decision and tries to make the decision successful. So there's no political moves like, hey, I want this decision to fail because I was against it and I said I was going against it. And this, the CEO basically said, you know, we're going to go this way. Yeah. You know? So actively yeah. working behind the scenes to support to under, their Yeah, their yeah instead position. of undermining the decision, work to make the decision successful. And that's what happened in our case. It was a hugely unpopular decision. Um, I was the CEO then, and I made the decision to go for it. Um, and it was a lot of painful, sleepless nights for them. 
But that's why startups win and lose as a team. But they spent those sleepless nights making the customer successful. And that turned out to be you know, a huge deal for us. We went cash flow break even because of which we could entertain M&A offers at our pace and at our terms That's and huge. when we wanted to when yeah. we went cash flow break even. And so all of that happened, but it wouldn't have happened if these guys hadn't supported the decision. So, so how do founding teams work? Well, I mean, you got to fight and you got to ask each other the tough questions. You got to challenge each other. You got to walk out of the room and do all of that stuff. But at the end of the day, when the team decision is made, you do whatever is possible to make that successful. Um, and your guys, in that case, oh, did that? Absolutely. I mean, how, how did you, um, I'm, I'm really curious about this because I've been through this as well. How did you present the decision to them? I mean, obviously, you, you had been debating it for probably weeks at that point on and off, you know, as, as the opportunity came on. So eventually you went back to them and said, hey, look, guys, you know, I know you disagree, but yeah, look, here's why. Here's why. So basically, the way I said it is, look, I'm looking at it not just from the product angle and the market angle. I'm looking at it from capitalization. I'm looking at it from, you know, how the company looks a year from now, what this does do to the strategy of our company, and... Presumably, it was a marquee customer, right? Like a name you could use with everybody Ouch. else. Top 25, top 50, top 25. Yeah. Um, Fortune 25, I mean. So, um, at the end of the day, I said, look, you know, as the CEO, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that this is the right thing for the company to do. And I would love for you guys to support me in this decision. Sleep over it. And so that's how we did it. Awesome. That's yeah. great. Yeah. And, that, and that's how you know you have a good team, team. right? Oh, Is yeah, when absolutely. The and they all came in and said, uh, I wish you're right. I think you're doing the wrong thing, but we're going to support you. Good. And yeah. you, you probably paid for it somewhere down the line. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that's awesome. That's great. That's great leadership. Um, all right, Tommy. Uh, Hope that is helpful. Let's move on here. This one is from Rick in Mountain View. The hiring of Andy Rubin at Redpoint was coupled with the news that he received $48 million to invest in his hardware playground. Is the $48 million from Redpoint, does it go into their fund or something else? What kinds of hardware is he going to invest in? So the news here is that um, I think in the spring, Andy became a venture partner at Redpoint right, right. after leaving Google. That's right. And then started this uh, company called, is it called Playground? Correct. And, uh, and so, and you guys funded Playground? Is Correct. that how it worked? Yeah. So um, Andy and us have a long relationship. Uh, Andy was the founder of... Uh, uh, Hip top Psy sidekick, kick. yeah, yeah, right, which was the first smartphone ever made. Uh, you know, danger, 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 yeah, I couldn't remember. Danger, you know, uh, made the first smartphone, right? It had a cloud based service, apps that you can download, all of the things that you know that you see in the modern smartphone. I'm just telling you, my producer Joel right now is really excited because that's like his favorite smartphone ever. So keep going, yeah, so. You know, and only a guy like Andy can do this, right? And so he he did that, obviously, <laughs> ironically, sold it to Microsoft. So Microsoft was the owner of the first smartphone. And, uh, you know, uh, they, he has a they, name. They've owned many smartphones they over the years, apparently. Over the year, yeah. <laughs> uh, but then uh, was involved with a couple of other Redpoint companies, Web TV, and, um, you know, uh, Android was the third company that he did, um, huh, curiously and ironically, he and I were EIRs at Redpoint together uh, 2003 uh, because he was incubating Android at that point. Oh, and you were doing uh, Zimbra at I the same time. I was doing Zimbra. We were just, you know, back then Andy would come up with all these ideas where he would have a camera 
he hacked a camera to have a GPS on top of it. And so wherever you would take a picture, you know, the picture would say, oh, this was uh, Cowper and Hamilton, hmm. you know, and things like that. Back in 2003, you know, it's geotagged photos. Wow. Um, he was, and obviously a guy well beyond his, uh, you know, well beyond time in terms of his way of thinking. Yeah. Um, and we were lucky to have the special relationship and bond that we had together. And we were always saying that whenever he does his next thing, he would do it with us. And he would, you know, it was just a great fit when, you know, when he came back uh, from Google. Um, so Playground is a hardware incubator. I mean, his office is, uh, I, you know, I wait for him to launch Playground. It would be unfair of me to launch Playground without what he's oh, talking so about. it's not announced yet. It's, uh, it's announced, but not in its entirety, but it's going to be a huge hardware incubator where it's going to be everything you can possibly imagine to, to conceptualize, design, and manufacture hardware products, um, complex hardware products. I mean, when he's building all the building blocks, you know, the Wi-Fi module and the Bluetooth module and everything, and uh, we're off to a great start already. Playground has, uh, you know, a funding structure that is not fully disclosed yet, uh, and the amount and the size and all of that. We're, uh, we're, the, we're the only thing that we've said is that we're investors and we're the only venture investors. Everyone else is strategic. Yeah. Uh, well, and some Playground. of those are in the news. I, yeah. I don't know if they've been announced by you guys or just yeah. rumors, but uh, big, yeah, big you companies. Can, you can read so. the news and yeah. it's all, I mean, this is Andy Rubin, so he can, you know. So is he, is he investing as well? Or yeah. Or, okay. He's been um, really, really good, you know. Um, I mean, actually, uh, an investment that um, I just led that I can't talk about yet. Um, we brought Andy in as well, and he he also invested, and he's going to help the company. And uh, it was great to have him around the table. It was a hardware company, and you know, we it was a really competitive deal, and you know, uh, it helps us to have Andy there too. Cool. You know, awesome deals. All right, well, that's um, hopefully that helps uh, Rick with his questions. Um, let's move on here. We have one from AJ in Toronto. What should one do when having a hard time finding co-founders with the right skill sets? So I don't know if AJ is the technical person or maybe yeah, yeah, the yeah, business does, person. Yeah. Or it could be either I mean, way. there's a lot of, you know, um, you know, it's almost like asking, how do we find your spouse, right? Yeah. It's, it's as difficult a question as that. Um, the, the best ways uh, I can think of is uh, to go work your network. So it's someone that you trust refers you to someone that they trust uh, versus, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways in which you can go ran randomize it. There are all these different ways. You can find people on the internet and you know, search on LinkedIn, search on LinkedIn and connect and all that. Um, Sounds similar to the way you do deals get referred deals to, get right? referred to, yeah. Same thing. It's so hard, you know, I mean, uh, founders are all type A personalities and f finding one or two or three that can work well together, understand each other, um, as well as, you know, nominate a CEO and defer the ultimate decision-making authority to the CEO like we talked about. All of those dynamics, uh, they're really hard to find. And so I would, if you can't find someone in your own network, then I would go one removed from your network, but someone that you know, you, you know and trust says, hey, I worked with Joe before, and he's got these weaknesses and these strengths, and you know going in that that's who you're going to deal with. Stay away from that Joe guy. Uh, yeah, I would stay away from yeah, the Joe guy. That's, you guys, that, that's like red point rule number <laughs> six, isn't it? Um, no, I agree. It's, it's really hard, right? And, and just um, uh, that marriage, because it is a marriage, yeah. and, and usually it's, it's at least two, sometimes four you know, yeah. people who are involved. That, yeah. um, you might end up losing one of those along the way yeah. just yeah. out of, you know, yeah. For whatever reason, life reason, you know, yeah. somebody going through a divorce or, yeah, yeah. you know, they decide to move back to the East Coast or whatever. So um, that's a really hard, uh, hard thing. But when, when you get it right, 
And it sounds uh, like it Zimbra great. was one of those cases. Yeah, it like it, it was it's so great. Awesome. Yeah. Sa same in, in uh, multiple of my companies where yeah. you're just finishing each other's sentences. Yeah, yeah, you're, it's perfect. You're compensating for weaknesses. You know, yeah, I mean, like Scott Dietzen with Zimbra and now, you know, now he goes and becomes the CEO of Pure, and I'm just along for the ride. And, you know, I don't even have to worry about what he does there because I know he is. He is who he is, and he's going to kill it there. So, you know. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Um, here's another one. This one is from uh, Summit in San Francisco. Once you invest, how do you work with an underperforming team to improve their performance? What specific things do you say or do? So that's yeah. a that's a great question. I I saw something in the last couple of days talking about um, your mood as an investor. Uh, is as low as your lowest company, right? Like, like that's or no your, doubt. your stress level no or whatever. So no doubt. So what do yeah. you what do you what do you do? Uh, somebody's not performing. You're obviously not the CEO, so you can't jump in there and like yeah. start doing stuff. I think you know uh, the big thing there is actually the same qualities that you would need to be a successful leader and a CEO. Um, I mean, if you think about the progression of a manager to a senior manager to a director to a VP to a CEO, you're relinquishing control at each time. And rather than doing things yourself, you're trying to help other people do things. And if you're a CEO and if your VP of marketing is not performing, it's the same issue as your VC and your CEO and your team is not performing. So what do I mean by that? Um, so uh, I think think everyone has different ways of dealing. I think the best way and the most successful CEOs are, are trying to coach people and help them succeed and help them learn, uh, but, you know, are also acutely aware, are also judging them, you know, at the same time on whether there is a progression or whether there is, you know, hey, you know what, you're great at A, B, and C, but you're just not cut out to do X, Y, and Z, hmm. you know. And so let's find something for you in the company that where you will succeed and where you will perform at your best. And uh, great teams and great founding teams want the company to be successful, and they're like, okay, you know, I wanna, I wanna do that. So uh, the way to do that is uh, in a more uh, in a way to coach them rather than lecture them uh, or, or yell at them or, you know, that's just, that's just, you know, uh, that doesn't work. Uh, so you got to figure out how best to help them succeed and improve their trajectory. And if that means getting a mentor or a coach or saying, okay, here are five things that I, you know, stop focusing on everything else. The next board meeting, here are just these five things. Just report on these five things, yep. you know, and that's all that matters in this company. And it may be different five things for different people, different companies, different stages. Maybe for this company, it's like okay, it's what's what's most important, and then allow them to help them narrow and focus and see if that helps. And you know, there are then there are mentors, and you help coach them. Other things you help hire people around them. We a lot of times say, okay, hey, you know, let's hire people around this area where you know there's weakness to compensate for something compensate that's missing for something all that's right missing. all right great advice um we got time we got one minute left for a quick one uh, matt and mill valley it seems there are way too many startups and not enough great employees to go around would a correction that culled some weaker startups be a net positive in the long run what do you think absolutely yeah um look i mean there's two there are two things going on there's lots of capital Everyone can get seed funded, right? Yep. And then uh, the Valley, which is a good thing, is breeding a lot of companies. And so, um, but people talk about the Series A crunch, and the reason why there's a Series A crunch is the Series A is pretty healthy. Everyone, so much capital has increased in maybe twofold, and I don't know the exact numbers in the Series A uh, stage, but the seed spectrum has grown hundred thousand fold yeah and yeah. so you know the signal to noise ratio has dropped dramatically uh, at the at the a level and so is that sustainable I don't think it's sustainable in the long run um, I think there's going to be some consolidation in the seed 
in the seed stage. And you see that happening. I mean, the exuberance from five years, three years ago, even at the Series A level is, you know, now like, hey, you know, you don't want to seed every company that comes your way before right. it was like, Everything. you know, yeah. All right, great. Well, we're out of time, unfortunately. Um, thank you for doing such a great job. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, you can uh, follow Satish on Twitter. His handle is Satish D, S-A-T-I-S-H-D. And his firm is at Redpoint VC. So uh, follow him and follow his firm. Um, thank you once again to our fantastic sponsors, Auric, Square One Bank, Accretive Solutions, and Ustream. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at Founderline. Um, you can tweet to us there. You can send us questions in advance to help at Founderline.com. You can go to the website and read about uh, upcoming guests, uh, watch the previous episodes, and also um, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Thanks for watching. Here's to the crazy ones, and we'll see you again next time.